This is the Fuel Sports Network. And that's the bottom line. Welcome, everybody, to the bottom line. Easy E and Brett the Hitman's joining me for another thrilling week of breaking down the UFL 2024. What a big week it was. A sweet week. Was the cream gonna... rises to the top. <laughs> and we <laughs> the... always rise. To the top. <laughs> and, and doesn't it and doesn't it taste <laughs> good? Oh, <yeah. laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna start off with uh, breaking down the first game of the weekend, and to me, it was one of the biggest debacles that totally oh. changed totally changed the XFL division. I mean, it was like a night and day difference of what it should have been, and. I mean, you're looking at Arlington. Arlington holds that lead and gets the win. They're looking at being one game out of the lead. And instead, by letting that game get away, they're looking up at three teams with a two-game lead. That's To me, that's just devastating. Absolutely devastating. Yeah, watching that game, I tell you what, I mean, you you almost felt like, you almost felt like it had a San Antonio vibe there toward the end. You know, it looked like Arlington dominated that game. I mean, this is the thing I, I've, I've been reading on social media. People, oh, the fourth and 12, I hate it or I hate this. You know what? You know what makes these games exciting? If it's 28 to 18 in the NFL, guess what? Game's pretty it's much over. over. It's over. You've already, you've already went outside and started mowing the yard. And, yep, and, uh, it's over. You've already thrown stuff on TV. You've already put all your – you're already outside. Yep. But if you sleep on the UFL, man, 28 to 18 with two minutes to go, you are completely missing the boat. And that's what I love about it. I absolutely love it. And they so what's great, what's great about this rule, too, is that now we look at – we'll look at later on in the show, we'll, we'll look at another scenario – where we where the fourth and twelve could have been used and it wasn't. So we'll mm-hmm. we'll 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 bat that around. But but Brett, what did you think of that game? 
I mean, uh, once again, uh, it was kind of like what I mentioned going into the week. You know, Arlington is a pretty strong team inside the 20s, but they've had a lot of red zone problems. They've had to settle for a lot of field goals. And it looks like a lot of their games, like the first half of the Birmingham game in week one, they they kind of ran up and down the field. I mean, they kind of controlled Birmingham somewhat. And you look up, and it's a tie game at halftime, and, and Birmingham gets the ball first in the second half. Very, very similar feel with the D.C. game. And you could just you could see it coming. You could sense it and feel what was fixing to happen. And, you know, I, I hate it for Arlington. You know, I've flown down there before for Town Hall and met a lot of the fans. You know, Jimmy came to Tuscaloosa the other day, and I met had lunch with him while he was coming through, Jimmy Hanna. And... uh that you know, I, I don't want any of the teams to be zero and three right now. You know, I'm very happy that my team is the reverse, but zero uh, and three is a hell of a hill to climb in a ten game season. Now, can they do it? Can Arlington win six out of their last seven? I I really think they can, but uh, they field goals are not going to be an option for Arlington moving forward. They're going to have to put the ball in the end zone. Definitely, and you know, and you know one and one. One play that kind of comes up there towards the end of that game, too, and would it have made a difference? Who knows? But uh, the coach clearly thought that they were going to take the clock down to the two-minute warning there, and instead they went ahead and kicked the field goal, you know, with the clock at like two minutes, seven seconds or whatever, which basically in turn gave D.C. a timeout that they didn't have. Yeah. Um, now, they hit that big play. Uh, with plenty of time to spare. So did it really make a difference? Uh, possibly not, but uh, that just goes to show that uh, there's a there's a clear disconnect between the players and the head coach because, to me, heading into that field goal, you know full well, you've, you've already talked to the special teams group and, tell, and told them, okay, we don't have to kick it before the two-minute warning, so go ahead and and, and get in formation, but let it hit two minutes. You know, that you'd have thought that would have been a conversation that everybody would have been on the same page. It should right. have been a given. It should have been a given. I, I don't I don't understand the thinking there. It should well have been and a Stoops, given. you gotta remember too, Stoops has been he's been around these rules. He was around in 2020. He was around last year, obviously, when they came back and won the championship. So this isn't like he's a new coach and, and having to still get adjusted to these rules. So I mean, didn't they kick it with like wasn't it two oh nine or and, and they had or two two eleven and they had no, they, another they, eight they, seconds they, to run off? Yeah, they and had kick it uh, and then get it to the they, two minute warning. Yeah, they kicked it. They snapped the ball at two oh seven when there was eleven seconds left on the on the game clock, or uh, and so they could have you know obviously let it run down to the two minute warning and. Well, yeah, they could have got it down to about two oh five, two oh four. Kick the ball, run those seconds off, and you're at the two minute warning. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but you know, they could have let the clock go to two minutes and just waited to kick the field goal till afterwards. But, but uh, no, I mean, it's you talk about some bad luck. I mean, Arlington, you know, they, you know, Birmingham kind of pulled away from them in, in the week one. So, you know, is that a game that I mean, they stayed competitive in that game for quite a while, but in week two and week three, they're literally seconds away. Or one play away, you know, in the St. Louis game, Arlington had the ball third down and six, well in St. Louis's territory. That if they get the first down, they run the clock basically down to nothing and kick the game-winning field goal, and it's over. Yeah. And, it, and instead, they don't get the they don't get the first down, and then they their kicker, who's about as close to automatic as you get in the XFL, just totally pushed it i mean it was so so you go from and then the very next week 10 point lead with two minutes left on the clock and and you find a way to to lose it so i don't know it's like brett said it's when you're 0 and 3 in a 10 game season it's it's pretty hard to turn the tables and come back from something like that those are the devastating losses when you're up, you know, like they were 28 to 18, and then you give the lead up in two minutes. I mean, those are devastating. I mean, now <clears throat> we can sit here and, and again, I've seen on social media people complaining about the fourth and 12, but 
you know, if your defense makes a stop or your defense, you know, makes them really work for every yard, might not come to that. But, man, it just – it was like D.C. was just on a roll. And there was – I mean, Arlington was holding a handful of sand. They just couldn't hold on to it. It happens. Well, I mean, and, again, when your team loses, people going to whine and complain about the refs. They're always going to find something. And whether it was 4th and 15 or 4th and 12 or 4th and 18, whatever the rule is, and we all know it's 4th and 12, we're all playing by the same rules, guys. And, uh, you know, uh, week two against Michigan, Birmingham was almost in that situation. And, uh, ultimately, it just shows that your team's got to play 60 minutes. You've got to finish. You've got to finish. Uh, and, and, again, you know, we're going to see more of that this year. We're probably going to see a couple more 4th and 12 conversions. We'll, we're going to ultimately see some stops as well. Uh, but, again, it, it, it's just – grabbing it's just sore losers grabbing and uh, you know we see it every game whether it be college pro uh spring football fans are always going to come out of the woodwork and bitch and complain and, and point at something other than the fact their team just did not take care of business right well and the biggest thing is you know <clears throat> and you see it in the ufl just like you see it in the nfl and anything else we're all fans of a team right i mean you're a birmingham fan and Ed and I are Battlehawk fans. But you know what? I think the thing that some people are not able to do is they're not able to separate that so, themselves and say, okay, I'm a Battlehawk fan, but for the good of the league, hey, we lost this week, but we'll get them next week. You know, they just, they're just they just complete fans. They want St. Louis to burn. They want Birmingham to burn. They want Memphis to burn or whoever it is. Yeah. You know, until we're – seven years deep in this thing or whatever it is like we really i mean we we, had, we still have to be fans of the league right you know we can't afford to just be battlehawk fans we can't afford to just be birmingham fans we can't afford to just be san antonio fans we have to be fans of the league first and when well, and i know you've probably seen some of my posts the last uh, mm. few months and i've said it from day one with spring football you rooting for your own team and rooting against the league or whatever that that's not that's not going to cut it's not gonna it. It's not going to work. Can't have it. It's got to what? be. You can root for your team. I mean, I can root for the Battle Hawks, but I'm also rooting for the league. You know, I don't just watch the Battle Hawks game. I watch all four games every weekend. So I got good football. So I got a ton of respect for Reggie Barlow because I watched him basically all the last this season consistently win. From beginning to end, uh, he and he just put a quality effort on the field as players every week, week in and week out. So this year, when uh, DC struggling out of the shoot and they weren't playing their best football, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, pile up those losses, man, pile up those losses because when they figure it out, they're gonna, you know, be a right. You're gonna have to contend with them again. So what happens this year is they're not playing their best football yet, and they're two and one. Yeah. So you know, so there's a team to look out for. They got they got to figure a few things out, but I got a lot of trust in Reggie Barlow that he's going to figure it out when he does. Yeah. I have no doubt they're going to be there towards the end to, to be battling for a playoff spot. That's for sure. I thought about yeah. after the DC game. I this is exactly what crossed my mind. I thought to myself. Uh, they still don't have it figured out, and they're sitting at two and one, and we play them later. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. by the time they get to St. Louis, they'll have it all figured out. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> one of those deals. You know, why can't yeah. we play them now when they don't have it figured out? Yeah. yeah, I know we need to move on to the uh, to the next game, but uh, just to add a little bit more to the DC scenario, if they leave Arlington one and two. They've got Birmingham Saturday night in Birmingham. That was a huge win for D.C. because if they leave Birmingham Saturday with an L, they would have been one and three. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you know, going into week five, they're going to be two and two. That's worst case scenario. That, that was a huge game for D.C. And look out. They come into Birmingham and upset Birmingham and in their 10-game winning streak or whatever it is. They're, they're, I mean, like you said, they're headed in the right direction for sure. 
Well, let's uh, let's go to a quick break, and when we come back, we'll jump into the Memphis uh, Birmingham game. Got lots to talk about there, so we'll be back shortly. Houston, we've triumphed. I've made it back to Earth with the cargo intact. The game-changing, time-sensitive payload is none other than the revolutionary energy flavor we've all been waiting for. Introducing Merc Mayhem, Cherry Limeade. Merc Clan played a crucial role in securing this energy flavor. And together, we've unlocked the future of power. Merc Mayhem is not just a drink. It's a statement. A fusion of relentless energy and bold flavor. The secret is out. Merc Mayhem is set to redefine the energy landscape, leaving ordinary drinks in its cosmic dust. Get ready for a taste explosion that matches Merc Clan's unparalleled power. Join the revolution and let's unleash Merc Mayhem upon the world. Astronaut M signing off. I thought it was important to play that before we come back for this next game just because I'm sure there's plenty of disgruntled Memphis fans out there that that uh, need a little pick-me-up, But I, so I thought I'd play that. But uh, holy smokes, uh, I'm not saying that the wheels are coming off, but, uh, you know, I think all three of us, we had a pretty – we was top Memphis pretty high before the season started, and they're definitely – you know, no, they can turn things around. There's no doubt about that. But boy, are they struggling, especially this last game. They have legitimately struggled, I would say, for nine, maybe ten quarters. Yeah, and it does not look good. Um, well, I don't, keep, I don't even know what to make of it. What do you think, Brad? I mean, I, I don't even know what to make of it. I, I still go back to this, and I know no matter what happens, and you guys are just as big of football fans as I am. Put a W next to your name on a game or you put an L. It is what it is. It don't matter how you got there. But that being said, we all know, and everybody that's watching knows, Memphis was this close, this close to being 2-0 and going into Birmingham. And look, whether it's 12,000, 15, 18,000, whatever was in Birmingham, we're a boisterous bunch. We're loud. The, the players really feed off us. So a lot of us are friends with some of the players. A lot of them have been back three years now in Birmingham. We've got relationships with some of those guys. And I tell you what, they love playing in front of the home crowd. And they're usually a totally different team at home. And I feel like Memphis walked into a buzzsaw and walked into a perfect storm. I still feel like Memphis is every bit of a potentially a playoff team. And, and I feel like you guys should too. Let's face it. We saw the San Antonio game. I mean, nine times out of 10, the team is uh, wins that game. And that means Memphis would have been two and zero going into Birmingham. I hope that their fans will continue to support them and their fan base will continue to grow. I do think uh, D. Filippo is the right man. I think they've got a lot of good players, but but what's happening? And I think you guys can attest to this. I, I saw it firsthand. I watched a replay in the middle of the night last night. Birmingham's defensive line man handled their offensive line, and I said it before the season started. I know you guys aren't familiar with Case Cookies uh, that played with the Philadelphia Stars, but now you know what I said was true. That boy's the toughest kid I've seen in spring football since I've been watching it. Since I was oh, a kid. Case took us took a beating. He took a beating and kept coming back for more. The coach finally had to pull him. You know, I mean 
Yeah, he, but he I would not him. give up on Memphis. Memphis can absolutely right the ship, <laughs> but they have got to shore up that offensive line. Now, if they shore up that offensive line with uh, Vinny, with Sage Surratt, with the receivers they've got, and Case Cookies, and Memphis has got a stout defense now. They really do, especially at front seven. Memphis could absolutely end up six and four, seven and three in the season and be playing in the playoffs, but they have got to get the offensive line settled or Cookus and his backup will not make it through the season. No. I thought Cookus, I mean, what he eight sacks. I mean, it was ugly. That that guy And the worst like, one he took, <clears throat> the worst one he took, Eric didn't even count because we had a guy in the neutral zone. Yeah. When he got hammered in the end zone there for a safety that didn't count. Yeah. When when he got hit, everybody in the stadium go, oh, we're all looking at each other like, you know. They're going to be scraping him off the field. <laughs> and you know what? Eventually, his ass got up, and he just kept going, bro. I'm telling y'all, he's he don't look like much. I've, I've met him in person. He don't look like – I mean, he's just a string bean. But that boy is tough as nails. And he took a beating like that. Uh, with Philadelphia in the USFL last year. They had the worst offensive line in the USFL last year, and he took a beating last year. All respect to Case Cookus and Memphis fans. Support your team. Uh, they're, they sure up that offensive line now. They, they're going to be legit. They're going to be a problem. Well, I know he's a competitor, and I know you know as, as bad of a beating as he was taking, he didn't want to come out of that game. And, you know, of course, they had the cameras on him on the sideline when the, when a teammate was talking to him about being pulled. And, and he did not he did not care for it. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, he, and mm-hmm. he even, if I, if I listened to it right, he even sounded like he was questioning that, you know, the reason of why he was actually pulled by the coach. But, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Coach DiFilippo was, you know, he had the best interest. Hey. At heart hey, he time. took a beating in Birmingham last year when he was with the Stars. Again, they they had a couple major injuries early last year and lost two of their offensive linemen before. Right as the season started, I wanted to say in, in practice and then lost their second one in game one, whoever they played last year. And in, in case, just, I mean, my goodness. Look, he goes out on the shield now. That boy will go out on his shield. He's a warrior. Well, when I, you know, one of the big plays of the game to me was in the first half. When you, when you know, they're going down the field and it's fifteen to nine, I think it was, and uh, Memphis is going on a drive for a potential go-ahead touchdown, and instead they, you know, they get the field goal to cut it to three, you know, and you're thinking that's going to be three going into half, and they end up turning right around with, you know, there wasn't that many seconds left on the clock. 11, they, I believe. Yeah, they yeah. turn around and give them the three right back again, right before halftime and put the lead back at six. I Did thought you that, see that you know, back I, shoulder throw and catch. Yeah, you I can, thought you that can't was defend a, that. Yeah, I thought that was a devastating play mm-hmm. to give up that field goal right before half. Yeah, because Birmingham got the ball first in the second half, too. That was very yeah. devastating. I agree. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and I'm pretty sure we called this on last week's show. So I'm guessing that Coach Holtz probably watches the bottom line, but uh, inserting Adrian Martinez for Matt Corral, I think has made Birmingham a way, 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 way more dangerous team. I wish I could share some of the screenshots I got before the game and during the game of uh, fellow fans and, and friends mm-hmm. of the Birmingham Stallions fan group that I run. Uh, I, I got texts. I got phone calls. I got messages. What's this deal with Martin? Most of the other guys, for some reason, favored uh, Corral. And, and to me, Corral makes some beautiful NFL throws. But my problem with him is the, the, the little the little tosses, he just, he just tosses into the ground for some reason. I don't know if it's his form or if it, it just gets in his head. He is not making the easy throws. And then Martinez adds that extra bit with his legs and listen you know it was to me it was 50 50 but i kind of favored martinez but all my buddies were like why is he in there corral should be in there and i'm like i don't know i guess y'all been watching a different game than what i've been watching 
the first two games because I thought Martinez had the edge. He threw an absolute dime down the sidelines for that touchdown, and I was like, "Uh oh!" If he, and that if back he, shoulder throw to get yes. that field goal at the end of yep. the first half. If he, he could have made a better throw, if he gets consistency, holy buckets! I mean, he's always dangerous on his feet. Let's 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 face it. Right. That's, that's always going to be there. But it was right. funny um, this morning on Fox Sports. Uh, they were talking about that, like uh, Keyshawn Johnson was like, I was watching that game, and I was like, Martinez, Martinez, which Martinez is Adrian Martinez? What's he doing in that league? I mean, you know, it's like he's, he, you know, I, I just what I watched on Saturday, it was like he's he's there, he's there. But he's, Skip he's holes don't get the credit he deserves, man. I, I don't care if we go three and seven. This year, if we lose the rest of the game, Skip Holtz has done a fantastic yes, you do. job. You care. You care. You well, care. I do care, but I'm still <laughs> going to give Skip all the credit in the world, man. He's these are three different quarterbacks, bro. That he's, you know, when it was Jay Moore in the first uh, first year, then it was Magoo year two, and now Jay Moore's on the bench, and and you know he's got Adrian and Corral. I mean, and. He is such a good coach at playing to these guys' strengths. And uh, I want to give another shout-out to a guy I know that watches the show from time to time, and that's uh, Potter, Zach Potter, the GM for the Birmingham Stallions. I finally got to meet him Friday night at the uh, pep rally and ring ceremony. And this kid, and, and I call him a kid because I'm an old man now. I'm an old-ass man. He's 23 years old, fellas. 23 years old, and he is the best, the best GM in uh, spring football. You know, I told my buddy, I said, man, take a picture with me and, and Potter and yada, yada, yada. And I'm standing there talking to him, and, and Marty said, now, who are you? And I looked at him. I said, who he is is a 23-year-old kid that's the best damn GM in the business. That's who he is. And and, uh, and Zach just started laughing. He said, I appreciate it. And, of course, he had both his rings on. I yeah. mean – He's 23 years old, fellas. Like Jay, like Jay comments here, Martinez, 334 yards passing and three TD, TDs, QBR rating of 129. Not bad. Yeah, 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 he did look pretty good, that's for sure. Uh, he yeah. had that one fumble, and I'll give Memphis credit once again. You know I'm high on their front seven. They got a strong front seven. He broke one run. Uh, Saturday night for for a good chunk of yardage. Other than that, they put they kept him in that pocket, but he made his throws. But maybe I I'd be surprised, fellas, if Memphis don't end up right in this ship. I but they've got to solidify that offensive line. Can they write it in time? Because I mean, you know, if Birmingham, let's say Birmingham wins out, okay, that leaves that leaves Houston, Michigan, and, and Memphis. Well, Houston's not Michigan. a factor. I get it, but I'm saying Michigan, I, I've been impressed with them. I've been impressed with them. Well, they've got the defense, I, you know, that I told you guys they had. We knew that. Uh, E.J. Perry, the quarterback, had only played in, uh, I think, a uh, game and a half last year, maybe the last regular season game, and then their playoff game. And you could tell that he, you know, he was a lot better than what they had had previously. Uh, they added a, a big weapon at running back that big, uh, was it Hills, Hills from the Rakers? Yep. And then you see that speed demon that they've got number nine. He's done broke two big touchdowns and back to back weeks, you know. Sims. Sims. Yeah. Yeah. Against Birmingham and then against Houston. So you're right. Michigan's absolutely. Uh, but hey, Memphis has got two games left with Michigan. They play them twice. Those are going to be, if they can protect Cookus, watch out. But if, if they don't. <laughs> If they don't fix that offensive line, it's going to be a long rest of the season. It is. It is. I hope uh, St. Louis got the blueprint uh, from Birmingham for uh, next week. I was going to say mm -hmm. Memphis goes to the Battle Dome this week, don't they? They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I'm a Memphis fan right now, I'd probably do this. I'm, <laughs> I'm always afraid, though. I'm always afraid to be that that next game. After yeah. the team lays an egg the previous week because, you know, they're going to come in loaded. For they, got, they got manhandled, and, and I was not expecting that. You know, I was hopeful and thinking, you know, unless we have a bad game here, I, I think we can win this one. 
but I was not expecting that. Well, I this, I mean, realistically, this was the first blowout of the UFL season. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I could not believe it. I could not. I mean, I was watching the game just like I, this. I mean, they just look. Well, 12 games and one blowout. That speaks a lot for the parity of the league and what we mentioned before the season started, that we were going to have a lot of really good close games. Uh, I hope for the Houston and Arlington fan base moving forward that they do start winning some of those close games. I'd hate to see a team, you know, two and eight or one and nine. You, you don't ever want to see that, you know. Right. Uh, but Please that being worry. said, there, there's going to be some changes made in Houston in all season. You can, you can make book on that. When we come back, Houston and Michigan. As you can imagine, this next game, I would be amiss if I didn't give uh, Mike Palco a chance to come back on and talk about his Michigan Panthers. But while we're waiting for him to show up, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Houston. Um, I've had the opportunity of listening in on probably three or four press conferences so far of Houston, and I've kind of walked away from every press conference kind of thinking that there was just something lacking. I don't know. I've, you know, I, I've listened in on quite a few other press conferences for other teams, and it just seems like there's a disconnect. And I think that it's maybe starting to show a little bit on the field too. Well, when that game guys? started, well, when that game started, you know, Houston went right down and scored. And I thought, oh, Sinet's in there now. He's going to make a big difference. We're, you know, they, they're going to right the ship here and things are going to look a lot better. And it was just like after that first drive, it was just back to, uh, you know, very lethargic. You know, they just, I don't know. I expected, I mean, 30, would they give up 30, 34 points? You know, defense uh, defense is what Houston was going to hang their hat on. Right. And it just has not happened. I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of agree with that over there. I I just – I don't see what's happening with Houston. It just it just doesn't look good. There's nothing about Houston. I mean, we knew their offense was going to be something. I think we all called that at the beginning of the year. But we thought defense will keep them in games, you know, and, and because of the rules and things, they'll, they'll have a shot. Man, it just has not worked out that way. It is not – the defense has not carried them. The offense certainly hasn't carried them. It just has not looked good from any vantage point. Nothing. Um, I mentioned this to Ed, uh, uh, on, I guess, on the phone yesterday. I guess it was yesterday. Uh, one thing that caught my eye, which, which you know, I'm not a fan of the guy anyways, and I – publicly said I wish Houston would have done something different at head coach and some of the other coaches before the season started because uh, I had a chance to watch him and the gamblers last year and was not impressed whatsoever then a little bit more digging on his previous coaching record and all that and uh, this is definitely a league of opportunities because I, I I don't know if he necessarily should be a head coach not not to I'm not trying to bash the man I mean I know 
that's what I'm doing. I, I, I have nothing against him. But what stuck out to me was week one, Houston and Memphis. And, uh, you know, they, they've got cameras in the locker room. They get We get to see a lot of what the coaches are saying for the guys go back out on the field. And uh, he was talking, you know, and trying to pump up the players and everything he was saying. I was I was looking at the players in the locker room and and every one of them was either shaking their head and rolling their eyes. I mean, every one of them. And I thought, man, that's not a good sign. This is halftime of game one. And if you guys are already. Halfway giving up on him now, this is going to be a long season. And uh, they have got a a tough road to hoe, and I I would be very floored if, if they do turn around, turn things around, and he, you know, is still the coach with Houston next year. That's really about all you can say for the Roughnecks at this point. Well, as, as we talked about Arlington, you know, they're they're just a, a few plays here and there from being two and one. So yeah. there's something to look at with the Renegades and say, hey. Man, you know, a break here, a break there, and they're right there. I, I just – I don't see it with Houston at all. I can't sit here and tell you that they're a break here, a break there, away from being two and one or even having a win. You know, I mean, it just – I mean, can you – is there an argument to be said that Houston's defense has been on the field so long for three weeks yeah. in a row that yeah. now, the, now the defense is starting to break down a little bit because, I mean yeah. – I should have taken the time to look at time of possession, but I got to believe that Houston's defense. I got defense. that. Your, your time of possession, uh, Houston had it for 28 minutes. Michigan had it for almost 32. Well, so that, wasn't, that's not well, as bad as I would think. That well, I would there think. again, though, what I've noticed with the Houston coach, he's so freaking conservative. He don't ever go for it on fourth down. He don't ever – you know, they don't ever really dial up any trick plays, and it's it, – the defenders are on the sidelines watching this yeah. and and how can you continue getting motivated to go out there and cause defense is so much of an effort and a want to, and a look, I've got to, I've got to put this guy on his ass, so to speak. And how are you going to be motivated to do that over and over knowing that, that your offense is lackluster and your coach is not going to take any chances. It's it, there's just not any motivation there. Uh, I, I feel really bad for the Roughneck fans and some of the Roughneck players. Just These next seven weeks could, could be really bad. Uh, now, keep in mind, guys, Mark Thompson is a motivator. He's an alpha. He's a bull. He's a hell of a running back. He hadn't been on that field yet. If he can hurry up and get back, and I think he's close to coming back, if, if I hear that correctly, that could really give those players that extra – energy that extra adrenaline to hopefully give them something to want to turn things around but if, if he doesn't come back for some reason i mean we could be looking at an 0 and 10 team i mean you look at you know if you look at the passing yards uh between houston and michigan the, there's only 13 there are sorry excuse me um 11 yards difference passing when you look at a lot of these games, when you start going to the rushing, uh, Houston put 53 yards on the ground and Michigan rushed for 124. You know, when you're able to control the game like that and you're able to set your tempo, that opens up the passing game. You know, I mean, it, it just seems like, when you, you know, especially as we get further and further along here in the games, when the offenses are starting to figure it out, now we're starting to see backs put yards on the, on the ground. You know, that first week, it felt like if somebody rushed for 80 yards, that just will have been 150. Right. Now we're starting to see backs, and we're starting to see them really get traction on the ground. And when you start to separate on the ground, that really makes a difference in these games. I didn't look and see uh, what Birmingham's was. I think it was uh, substantial in that game as well when it came to the rushing. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Pearson, uh, number Memphis, 23, really Memphis got going in yards. second now. 20 yards. Yeah. Uh, what did Birmingham have? Memphis had 20 yards. Birmingham had 100. You know, so, I mean, but, I mean, in that game, the passing yards were pretty lopsided too, 324 to 192. But, 
I mean, it just Birmingham seems like just owned that line of scrimmage, and football yes. is still a line of scrimmage game. Yes. So let's talk but, about I mean, let's talk about Michigan's side of the ball. You you know you can start with none other than the field goal kicker. <laughs> uh, I mean, he backed up with you know he had a they tried to ice him on a fifty-five yard field goal. So what did he do? He go ahead and made that one and the one after that. So. I mean, we were looking at some crazy stat yesterday during the, you know, the San Antonio uh, St. Louis game that kickers in the UFL on kicks over 50 yards are like 17 out of 17 or something like that. It was 18 out of 18. I I think right now it's 18 out of 18 for the year. Is that not just? I mean, these field goal kickers have been money. They oh. come out on the field, and it does not matter. We were more, texting, times than, us. more times than not, that ball's going right down the middle, and it's clearing the crossbar yeah. by another five to seven yards. I mean, it's just incredible. I and have it's not like, seen a, I have not seen a, a long kick where I was like, ooh. Uh, I mean, as soon as they hit it, you're like, well, that's down the middle. You know, I just, <laughs> what, hey, I no got question. one for you. The, the Birmingham one, one, what was it, 57 yards the other night? And right when he kicked it, I said, oh, that, that's short. That's short. And uh, and dude behind me said, yeah, I think you're right. And the damn thing carried out, And it, it cleared it by about two yards. But right when it, it was halfway there, I'm like, there's no way it's getting there. Well, it got there. I mean, yeah, it's just. So it's like, where are these, where are these field goals? I mean, the NFL must have what was sleeping on these guys because where are all these guys coming from? I mean, that shows you, know, you that the NFL scouting is not perfect. Some of them, it's the good old boy system where, you know, this agent, I'm buddies with this agent and his friend, I know his coach and all that. There's some of that going on because I'm telling you right now, a lot of our kickers should be in the NFL right now. You're, you're on the money with that. I would say it's probably the strongest group in the league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you can make an argument that the kicking group is the strongest group in the league. Now, yeah. I will say, and I know we kick off from the 20, but, you know, maybe there's a, you know, uh, in the NFL, they like to have your kickoff guy be your, your field goal kicker. Maybe they don't have the leg for that. Maybe that's what's holding them back. But I tell you what, um, when it comes to 60 and in or even 65 and in, these guys are put it in the bank. I mean, I, mean, I don't I even that Michigan kicker could kick it could kick seventy and not worry about pulling a muscle, man. No. I, mean, I mean, it's not. That's, you know, and I and I kind of feel like the Battlehawks have probably one of the weakest kickers in the league. But yet, I'm thinking to myself, what are you basing that off of? Because <laughs> Because he, he, like he, made, he made like a 54-yarder, and it's almost reaching the point where you're saying, yeah, but that was only 54. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you I know. know. It's like, holy cow. I mean, so I would be surprised. I mean, they talk about – they talk about uh, – it's Bates, right? Yep. They talk about yep. him. Uh, you know, what are the Lions waiting on? Well, how come they haven't signed him yet? But you could say that about a lot of these other kickers too. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's 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 definitely. I'm not saying there's another stronger groups, but man, this is a strong, strong group in the UFL. No question. Is Mike still coming on tonight? That's what I. Uh, we go to a break. I'm gonna have to see if I can uh, get a hold of him and find out what's going on, but. Uh, I was hoping maybe he'd jump on the comment line too and give me an update. But uh, let's go ahead well, and take our let's go ahead and take another break and uh, see if we can't get him on here. All we'll right. Be right, we'll be right back. Same great taste. Yes. Uh, 
waiting to hear from him yet. So let's let's do something quick here and see if he jumps on or not. But let's uh, – Eric and I were kind of talking about this before uh, we went to live tonight about coming up with some categories. And Amanda, that's not even funny. Thank you. that. <laughs> <laughs> You need ah. to find something to find something to do. Yeah. <laughs> you need to find, here I do her taxes today and she comes on with something like that. Let me see. Yeah. I think she and like I used to respect. tell my wife, no good deed goes unpunished. That's right. And I think I think that we're probably gonna agree with a lot of these categories, but maybe we let Brett go first to so see if he if he agrees with us. Okay, so yeah, through don't three weeks. Don't tell him ours. Don't tell him ours. Just say yeah, I won't tell here's, him. I won't. Here's the category one, and you tell me who you got. Category one. Right. And we're talking about all 10 UFL teams. Oh, he got the wrong message. Hold on a minute here. Let me answer him back. You know we're 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 missing time for the most important game of the week. I was going to say we're gonna have to move along if he don't tighten up. I will yeah. say this about Michigan though: I am very <laughs> pleased and happy for them. Uh, they've had all three games at home, and the the crowd does need to improve. But they've been loud, they've been boisterous, they've been into the games. Uh, my curiosity is: is they gonna play the same on the road? They're going to have the same energy and effort. You know, it's always tougher to play on the road. Uh, so that's going to, something we need to really check out yeah. in week four because I think it's going to be a race for for a playoff spot between, like we mentioned, in the USFL conference between Michigan and Memphis. And that should, should come down to the wire. And I want to say they play each other the second time this year in week nine. And in the final week, Michigan comes to Protective Stadium in Birmingham. Yeah. So, so Mike's going to be coming on here, but just let's go ahead and we're going to let's talk about the the St. Louis San Antonio game. And uh, when Mike comes on, maybe we'll get his thoughts on that. But we'll carry him over and have him be part of our pick segment. He can talk a little bit about Michigan on the other side, but. Uh, Let's go ahead and talk about St. Louis at San Antonio. And what is there the only to talk thing, about? I, well, I, here's what I would say. A beautiful um, game. Here's what I would say. I would say that last year when St. Louis played at San Antonio, uh, it was the infamous 4th and 15 in the XFL. And St. Louis was able to turn the tides on them and steal the win in week one of last season. And it and it was and so here we are coming full circle one year later, and the same opportunity presents itself for San Antonio to do the same thing in return, but they elected to not take the fourth and twelve, and instead they went ahead and kicked the ball off. And the the sideline reporter goes up to Wade Phillips, and he's like, hey, "Coach, you know, why didn't he you, he yeah, why didn't you take him. the fourth and twelve? We have three timeouts." Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Yeah, he was like, "I got like, to cut y'all off." He did not appreciate being no. asked that question in the heat of moment. In the heat well, of you moment. know what? Go back to my group because before he got interviewed and got confronted on the sideline about that, I posted. That's a dumb move. Said you got to go from fourth and twelve there, and everybody come on there attacking me. And oh, uh, imagine that Wade knows more football than you, and just on and on. And I laughed, and I said, "Fellas, have y'all been watching this game? They hadn't stopped St. Louis all day. Hadn't stopped them all day. I said it was a damn miracle that they stopped them and got the ball back. But in my opinion, you guys are absolutely right. That was that was just a stupid move on Wade's part. It, it worked out for him, uh, you know that particular instance, but. But here's the uh, deal. I think you got. I think you have to roll. You, I, I get it. Listen, I understand. From a coaching standpoint, you're saying to yourself, you know, we got the two minute warning. We got our timeouts. We're good. You know, our defense has that's, to make. That's the D. That's the defense in him. You know, he's yes, a defense. That's the defense guy. In him. 
but but you have you have the momentum of doing that to Memphis the week before. I think you take a little of the air out of your team when you don't ride with what got you there. I'm with you. Put, uh, put St. Louis's I, defense right back on the field. Yeah, I'm, don't I'm with let you. them relax. And he, I didn't bet nine do out it. of ten. Yeah, I bet nine out of ten people on my com uh, on my comment line on my post was just coming after me about it. And I'm like, it's a miracle they stopped it. I said, guys, St. Louis has done whatever they wanted to to them all day long. I said well, he should have absolutely done a fourth and twelve. I knew but, San Antonio was going to get the ball back because. You know what happens in those situations? You know, they run the ball. They run the ball, right. make you burn your time out. You run the ball, make you burn your time out, and then you punt it right. away, whatever. So I was nervous still, thinking they're still going to have a minute 54. The only thing I thought in my head was, if you put the ball in your hands right away, you give it to your team, you make the fourth and 12, I think the game is over. Yeah. The defense uh, is on its heels. It's been on, it's, it's been on, on the field. Now it's going to come right back on and get the stop. If they get that fourth and 12, the game is over. When you allow St. Louis to punt it away, now you've given the defense a little breather. Now you have it, you don't have to get into field goal range. You got to put it in the end zone. Right. That's a little bit different situation. And and to you know to talk to talk about that is, you know, to me, I see, you know, just you saw Wade Phillips, the defensive coach. I kind of saw Wade Phillips, the NFL coach. Yeah. Because to me, there's a big difference between the XFL fourth and 15 and the USFL fourth and 12. To me, a fourth and 15 just seems more daunting than a yes. fourth and 12. A, yeah. fourth and, a fourth and 12 just doesn't seem daunting to me. And so. <laughs> I prefer I the fourth and fifteen, which might be changed for the UFL next year. We'll see. So I look at Wade Phillips deciding on kicking it off with three timeouts on defense. I understand that, but it's almost like he was comparing: Do I onside kick it, or do yeah. I kick it deep? Versus mm -hmm. fourth and twelve and kicking it deep. Right. To me, there's a big difference there because to me. Fourth and twelve is nothing different than fourth and ten. If you got to throw the ball, right. there isn't really any difference to me. I, I, I right. just I so to me fourth and fifteen is a different game. Yeah, but that so, but I don't want to. I don't want to armchair quarterback it to death. I know that when we was watching the game live at the watch party. I know that we were all looking at each other thinking, why are they not going for the fourth and 12? I just, <laughs> I, I just, I just think everybody is, is so programmed now that that's the way these games go at the right. end. Right. That it's just automatic. Okay. We're going to score here. Then we get the fourth and 12 and we get the ball again. Right. And, and so you're I, right. And Wade was mad. He got pissed and walked away. Oh, oh yeah. He, that, that's that. he goes, he goes, I got three timeouts and the and what do they call it? The ultimate challenge or whatever that one yeah, is. And the challenge. Super challenge. Yeah, three yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and he away. just thought, you know, what are you thinking? Asking me that question. So yeah, I'm, not, I'm not going to second guess him because I can see in his mind how that would work out. But yet, when I hear Eric's argument about, you know, the the defense staying on the field versus getting that chance to rest and regroup, yeah. and talk to your coaches and and all that, it's, it is a big Put them right back out there. Yep. Put them yep. right back out there. Yeah, they're already on their heels. Yep. So we so uh, we finally got the guy here that uh, I was kind of worried about whether he was going to come on tonight. He, he yeah. got, Wait, we have, before, before we bring Mike, though, we got to talk about the big news for San Antonio. Mm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah, can't shorten Garber. this game. This is this is the game of the week. Come on, we can't shorten it because Mike wasn't on time. <laughs> Chase Garbers is out for the year. That is huge. Now, huge. Yeah. Now, Dormandy, now Dormandy, you know, he you know, he got quite a reputation in the XFL last year. There was quite a few, you know, people that were pretty high on him. 
Uh, Garbers but, was having a good season. He won yes. the job for a reason. He won the job, and, and but but if nothing else, you know, not to say that Dormandy won't come in and light it up, but if nothing else, their uh, depth just took a major hit. Yeah, right, hundred percent. I mean, that's the most important position in football. Yeah, I mean, that's I, so, I, I, I noticed, wouldn't say I wouldn't say at the quarterback when as as well as Garbers was playing. I wouldn't I wouldn't say. Well, it's just next man up. If I'm a no. San Antonio fan, I'm going, oh, boy. You're kind of almost like, not only did you lose to St. Louis, but we lost Garbers too. Man. So I, I will say us. this. Uh, I, I, look, I am so happy and thankful for the St. Louis Battlehawks fans and how rabid they are. And I will no longer pick against St. Louis because some of them get on my nerves <laughs> and I get in my feel over uh, feelings over that. And I, I, I picked the, the Brahmas the, and, and all night Monday, I was thinking there's no way I'm ever picking St. Louis again because of this fan and that fan and this fan. And I'm sitting there telling y'all Monday uh, Brahmas and I'm thinking the whole time, I know St. Louis is going to win hell. You know, if you, had, if I had to put money on it, I would be taking St. Louis. What am I doing? Well, that will never happen again. My apologies. St. Louis, or excuse me, don't want to make some folks mad, but San Antonio is who I thought they were, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, hey, just a quick little caveat. Easy E was three and one again this week and still leading. We're not counting my St. Louis one. pick because y'all know why I didn't oh, no, pick we St. Are. Louis. So that we don't are. count. That don't we count. Say, how much can we really listen to Brett's picks? when he gives the reason why he's doing the picks. I mean, it has nothing to do with the teams on the field. It has everything to do with feel like a well, fan. Well, I was in there. Michigan one time, and some guy flipped me off at a stoplight, so I'm taking this. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all a bunch of asses. <laughs> so here's what um, we're going to do. We're going to do the same thing as we did last week. We are going to come back on the other end. We're going to we're going to end the show on the Fuel Sports Network at nine o'clock. And Mike, just hold tight. We're going to bring you on when we come back from our break. This is and ridiculous, we'll fellas. We're the best show on Fuel Network. We need more time. We deserve more time. <laughs> and I'm asking for more time. And that is the bottom line. We've got so, to do our list. We've got to do our list too. We got to do our. Yeah, we've got we've, we've got, got a list. lot of stuff to do. And in fact, you know, Mike is going to be rewarded for his tardiness because he's going to have yes. more time to speak now. So see, he's going. Yes. So I, I got the method. Never now. reward people for bad behavior. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's go to a break. When we come back. All you Fuel Sports Network people will have to go on over to Facebook, the Pro Football Alliance, and join us. We're going to continue our conversation and get into our picks for week number four. We'll be right back after this. Kit for my win, I need my hands. This life is real, don't they pretend? Came off the We are back for hour two, and without further ado, let's bring on our president of our uh, Fuel Sports Network Michigan chapter, Mr. Mike Palco. Thank you for joining us, sir. Do you Thank not you own a watch? 
I was actually, so I thought that the show would be postponed tomorrow, but I did not see that it was about the show, the bottom line. So I that was me on my end. I read that wrong. I thought it would be this show pushed to tomorrow, but it was apparently a different show. So a bunch of shows going on, but not the show. So. Yeah, the That's right. Show. That's right. You got to look. And when you if it has a the in front of it, then you know you're talking about us. Otherwise, it's just another show. Still have my uh, my uh, my uh, UFL uh, show training wheels on, so hopefully I can get those off. <laughs> so, so Mike, for, yeah, congratulations, Mike. So heading oh. into the season, we all were talking about your three straight home games, and we was talking about how it was important for Michigan to get off to a fast start. We did. If if we would have told you when you saw the schedule that after three weeks you would be Two and one. Would you have been? Would you have taken it? I say that would have been a, at the time, wishful thinking based on what we saw from last year. Because there was a lot of questions, but we knew about the defense. We just didn't know anything about one, the offense, or a kicker that could kick half the half the yeah. football field. To get the Seventy percent of the football yeah, field. You know, yeah, we no. I mean, it's only person that knew were probably Mike Nolan and GM Steve Kayser are the only people that had some information on them that no one else did. But I thought, you know, I thought Houston would have been the one. You know, I would have been the all. Hey, you know, getting one out of three. You know, then you know having the. Uh, go on the road schedule, you know, and uh, but now my my prediction of six and four for the Panthers is looking more of like a reality right now. Yes, sir. Uh, what we had these first now with the injury news with uh, the quarterback for uh, San Antonio, San Antonio uh, Brahma's there. Uh, but you know, we we spring football, you, you you don't know, but we all think we know, but we but you to gotta play, gotta play the games. The only thing that I'll say, though, is that we're basing Michigan's performance so far this season off their performance of three straight home games. We don't know what they're what they're going to be as far as a road game, and you've got five of your next seven on the road. Well, one thing so, too about with being on the road, you know, is the uh, the travel probably a little closer than flying, going on a plane, flying up the Michigan. So may not feel like such a road game uh, for these guys after all, as much as, you know, the schedule shows it, but may not feel that way for the players. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Absolutely. So what was your, what was your takeaway from the Michigan Houston game well, from, I, both, from both sides, I guess. At first, you know, I was uh, talking with uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Saginaw Valley State who was at the game, too, and I was, uh-oh, when Saint, when uh, Houston marched right down and scored, it's like, okay, let's, you know, <laughs> defense, uh, you know, it's still a long way to go, but, you know, I brought, you know, I was like, okay, well, this we can't lose to Houston because based on, you know, the competitiveness of the league and how important divisional matchups are because we, we're chasing – uh, Birmingham, you know, kind of keep pace with them. Memphis, we know about them. They've had a couple losses, but they can get right back into the mix quickly, I, I think. You know, despite having their issues with the offensive line, you can't count the showboats out. So, in, important game. And I, I said, you know, my brother sitting next to me, like, this is a big-time game. Like, we cannot lose this game. And uh, when Houston marched right down, I thought, okay, well, offense has to pick up. They went down scores. I'm thinking we might have a shootout here. But as the game went on, uh, defense locked down, shut down. The crowd, by the way, I can't, you know, despite what the numbers on the attendance is loud in there, folks. And the quarterback for Houston, you know, he's having to cover up his helmet so he can hear the play call. Caught, and we, you know, as a fan base, caused multiple false starts. So I think it's very important for those watching, if you have a game near you, go with the game because you can make an impact and help out your defense uh, win some football games. So we'll do this now that we got Mike. We'll we'll make this a we'll make this a four person vote. Let's I made it. some categories before the show. I'm just gonna say the category. All ten teams in the league are available to be chosen. And I want everybody's opinion on what teams they would stick in these categories. Okay, first category is Stick a fork in them because they are done. 
Do you have any teams that you would stick in that category? Oh, for in, in terms of you, uh, the UFL um, for this season. You know, I I don't. I mean, I I'm saying Houston, but I don't want to. You know, teams can flip it around. You know, we can you four and sixteen can make the playoffs. Because all you got to do is finish in the top two. If you can get, if you're on the zero and three right now, you know Arlington, it, it's playoff time right now for those teams. They have every game's must win to get to that four and six mark. Your goal is to maybe hopefully have a shot at finishing second in your division or conference to get in. Um, I don't want to write anyone off yet, but you know, I can tell you that uh, Arlington and Houston are definitely on thin ice. I would say that Houston, if you, one more step the wrong way, you're falling through. I would say that uh, Ballhawk one chose Arlington and I would venture to say that Viva Texas probably agrees with them wholeheartedly on that pick. <laughs> What about what about you, Brett? Who do you put in that category? Then I'll tell you who I and Eric chose. Houston, Houston. Is that is that all you're going to put in that category? Is Houston? Houston, w without question. Uh, again, if Mark Thompson can come back, like Mike said, any anything can happen. Uh, a lot of it is effort and want to, but they need they need a sudden a sudden burst of of something, which I think Mark Thompson could give them. Uh, once he gets on the field, but I mean, out of the eight teams in the league, if if you gave me, you know, you've got to pick one, it it, it would be Houston of Arlington. I'm sorry for for a number of reasons: uh, lack of quarterback play, uh, pitiful coaching. Uh, yeah, I, I would take uh, Houston over Arlington in this category easily. So I put in my I put Houston and Arlington in there for this category and Arlington for, I'm surprised you guys aren't saying Arlington because you're looking at an 0 and three team. That's looking up at three teams that are two and one, three teams already have a two game lead on them with only seven to play. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at what Arlington did last year though. I mean, they were in very similar circumstances uh, they, wasn't they, were, they, were, they were in similar circumstances because they were in a different division. Let's yes. not forget that. Yeah, let's yeah. not forget this, the division. This division the, the, XFL the, the XFL division is not going to be 500 teams. I'll tell you that for sure. No. No. Okay, I, if, my if, next if anything, category. And if, and if anything, we could put maybe, maybe based on Mike and Brett, maybe we could put Arlington in the subcategory of life support. Well, well, uh, one, support, one A yeah. and one B. We said life support. <laughs> Mike used on thin ice, so I, that's probably the same that's, thing. Yeah, yes, that's probably the same off thing. Off but but we can bump I, Arlington. We'll put Houston down here. We'll bump Arlington right here and put them on life support. Yeah, but it, but uh, Eric and I both agreed that Houston yeah, and Arlington stick a fork were is, sticking a fork in them. Yeah. All right, the next category is hit the panic button. I would say uh, panic button right now. I mean, using you, San Antonio, you know, losing your starting QB. Like, who knows how Quentin Normandy is going to play out? You know, with, with all this uh, momentum with the the Brahmas right now. Uh, and I would say another panic button. Just, I love, I love the, uh, I love Case Cookus, but he is, you know, watching him. You no, know, and being a Philadelphia Stars employee uh, last year, it was actually for me painful to watch him just getting hammered hammered throughout the game and i'm watching that and i'm just man every time case cook has run for his life every play um hopefully they can get the old line fixed uh but two teams jay, I would... jay, jay 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 i got I, yeah jay i oh, was jay. i was at the i was at the watch party yesterday and oh my god I've got to, I got to call you out. I got to call you out, dirty. You guys started talking about Perez again. Perez or Perez, whatever. Perez. And I said he was the best. He's the best spring quarterback there ever was. And then it's he's the best spring quarterback, even though we're zero and one. And then oh, he's the best spring quarterback, even though they're zero and two. And now it's always the best spring quarterback, even though they're zero and three. And I get it; you can't throw it and run and catch it, and and all that thing they talk about the quarterback. But if you are a goat quarterback, 
you will your team to victory one way or another. Ask Tom Brady how that works out. Yeah. He had yeah. a lot of teams that he took to the Super Bowl that you put any other quarterback on that team, they even sniff in the Super Bowl. So was, uh, for once and for all, let's just calm the Jets on Perez is being, <laughs> being all about that for spring football. My God. Okay. Anyway, where were we? Okay. He, so had, we had, the, he had San Antonio and Memphis. He had San Antonio and Memphis on the panic button. What do we got? Brett, what do you got? Brett? Yeah, Memphis, absolutely. Uh, I, I still absolutely think Memphis could turn around and end up, you know, six and four this year. But just like I mentioned earlier for Mike, come on, and he just mentioned that the, the key to their future in this season is getting that offensive line fixed because what we've witnessed the first three weeks ain't going to work. It, it's not going to work for Cookus. He, he won't make it through the season. Neither will his uh, the second string guy. They'll be signing some guys. It, it if I was offensive line coach in Flippo right now, I'd be real, real nervous about trying to get that fixed and immediately. Yeah, so Eric and I both agreed for the panic button. We had Memphis. Panic and, button. And the Memphis. only comment, the only comment I had behind <laughs> behind Memphis <laughs> is what is going on? Oh, because man. I because I had Memphis. I mean, I was touting Memphis all along, and for it's just not adding up so far. So, hopefully, hopefully they can get it, you know, turned around. I know Coach Flip; I got a lot of respect for him because you know he was with the Vikings yeah. organization at one time, so that automatically puts his coaching ability towards the top. You well, know, well, let's not bring that up. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, so here's the next category. This we might have a few different opinions, but Mike, we'll start with you. The category is pleasant surprise. I mean, it's got to be the Michigan Panthers here with, uh, you know, with how we when you, when you first seen the opening projections of the league power rankings, you know, Panthers are around that seventh. Some have them at eighth, but now you know people seeing them, watching them, their defense is going to keep them every game. They're you know. They just offense gets put on the field is almost an automatic three points just by showing up on the field, uh, and then just happen to get down to the get near the fifty and you have a shot at three. But against Houston, now hopefully the offense now what we saw with uh, EJ Perry, you know he's throwing a lot more, he's looking more comfortable in the pocket, running it, taking he chances, was 84%. showing 84% some courage, completion. Yeah, showing a lot of courage in the pocket. So I think now with the offense, too, they get some film against Houston. So now uh, Marcel Belfe, he'll be able to, hey, this is all the good things. Let's keep, you know, building on this. So they will watch it, practice it, and apply it to the game. I think they're all getting uh, more confidence. And I think they'll be a team to really watch as the season builds. Um, and they're going to get more confidence and be a, probably a tougher opponent. So that last game against Birmingham might be a different ball game than what we saw um, first time around. So it's going to be fun to watch. So, Mike, you got, you know, everybody likes to bash on the St. Louis fans, but here you got a St. Louis fan giving Michigan a little love right here. Yeah. You know, so far, the leg is the MVP. Yeah. It's, you know, good publicity for the league, too, you know, and that was, uh, my brother even got a uh, it was a Battle Hawks Panthers football signed by Jake Bates himself. So that's going to be uh, worth. Uh, that's going to be on display in this collection. So that's going to be that's a big time uh, deal for the league and for Michigan, especially. You know, it has all the Lions fans assuming um, they are going to sign him. But I think there's going to be a bidding war for his services. So uh, let the games begin in the NFL world. Uh, but hopefully, you know to. Uh, Mike Nolan drawing a line in the sand saying, hey, you know, you aren't coaching them from my team until this season's done. So good on Coach Nolan for doing that. So what do you got, Brett? Who who qualifies as a pleasant surprise in your eyes? Well. Uh-oh, yeah. Excalibur, Excalibur doesn't think hey, much of well, Michigan, well, though. Well, think about who, for the Battle Hawks fans bashing Michigan, who's the one in the two and one on your record? So. You'll see that the whole season, and we'll. <laughs> oh, Lord. Hey, you, the, can't, uh, you can't argue. You can't argue with him. Can't argue yeah, with him. Yeah. 
That's, that's pro absolutely football. Doesn't right. matter how much you win. You just got to get the W. Yeah, a W is a W. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, <laughs> little, <laughs> yeah, Mike's a little blinded by his fandom because there's two teams. Uh, Mike, uh, you remember who was the two teams that was always voted seventh and last by just about every preseason poll, Brown and it was Michigan. And San Antonio. Both teams yeah. are two and one. I know San Antonio's starting quarterback just went now, but I would have to give it to both those squads because, yeah. I mean, uh, nobody, nobody gave either team a chance. Nobody, right. I- including including us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. So, my, mad respect to both of them at this point in the season. So, that must be that this category must be, mean that we're all right because. I know the three bottom line co-hosts here all had uh, Michigan and San Antonio as the pleasant surprises. So, so uh, here's the next category. Not sure yet. Boy, um, I think I, I mean it has to be. I mean, it's the obvious answer. DC. You know, we had, I think a lot of people had them projected as you know uh, championship. You know, faith. They'll win the XFL division. You know, a lot of people when they made their predictions, who's going to be who in the uh, game in St. Louis for the championship? You know, one side would be Birmingham Stallions, and a lot of people say in the DC Defenders. So, still a lot of mystery with the Defenders. But they, hey, they they came back in that in the last game and uh, pulled off a win. And uh, you know, still a team that thinks still trying to build their chemistry. So, it's still ways to go. But you know, they, we know what kind. They're a good football team based on you know last year, and they retain a lot of pieces. They have Chris Rowland from the Philadelphia Stars at wide receiver. Great, great, great talent he is. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see. So keep keep watch. Don't count them out, but you know, this keep one keep them circled. DC is absolutely what came to my mind because yes, they are two and one right now, but still, you're 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 not sure you know, which way to go with them and, and how you think they're going to finish the season. You, you're you thinking, you know, they, they could finish seven and three or they could finish, you know, five and five. And I think most people feel that way right now. That's, that's not DC fans, obviously, because you can see quite a few chinks in their armor, so to speak. And uh, as of right now, they're definitely, definitely not the dominant team they were last season, but, all it takes is, you know, have one more point than the opposing team, and, and that's what they did this weekend. So they're two and one. So I'll go with DC. Yep. And so that's a that's a four panel sweep there. We all had DC. But what's scary about that is like uh Ballhawk one says here, Smith was their offense. Yes, he was, and you could tell week one they were really missing him. But here we are. We're still not sure about him yet, but they're two and one. Yep. And they're fi- they're figuring some things out. I got you know Reggie Barlow is a great coach, and I have no doubt that that he's going to only improve on that team as the season goes on. So unfortunately, I'm kind of worried about DC, but for now, I got him as a not sure yet. So the next category on the rise. What teams do you see? Is being on the rise. Um, I have two here. I mean, it's I'm going back to uh, Michigan, and I'll go with uh, St. Louis. You know, the you know people uh, talking. You know, with the run game of lack of uh, in the first game with St. Louis. You know, fans going, oh, we what's going to happen with this team? You know, they're going to obviously we know they're going to throw it all over the place. But would teams, you know, hey, let's just we're going to play up. We're going to match up on their passing attack. You know, some questions in the air. I think. People in uh, Battlehawks Nation, for sure. Uh, maybe have hit the panic button some. But some may have. I think it was a 50-50. You guys may have a better idea. But from what I saw, you know, people were shocked by that um, loss to Michigan. And then, you know, back with uh, the second part, too. Just once again, tracing back to Michigan, going from bottom to what people projected to now being a contender, uh, possibly for this conference championship. So it's going to be a lot of fun the rest of the way. I would definitely go with St. Louis 1A and Michigan 1B. Uh, I, I think Ed 
and I keep going back to what he mentioned in, uh, after week one. He just nailed it on the head when he talked about the over-conservative play calling by St. Louis in week one, which was very, very similar to what they did last season. They would be conservative and get themselves in the hole, and then they would count on A.J. to, to, to pull them out of the fire, which was the majority of last season. And in the last two weeks, I can tell that their play calling has definitely – they've definitely loosened the reins. Their defense has improved from last year, a couple of the uh, free agent signings they had. And, I mean, St. Louis to me, and you guys remember, I, I said before the season started, I thought that St. Louis and Birmingham was on a collision course for the championship game in St. Louis. So, St. Louis 1A and Michigan 1B. And now, and Scott makes a good point that I don't know if it'll be this weekend or not, but probably more than likely the next weekend, Jacor Pearson's going to see his first action of the season. He started um, practice today. Did he? I'm interested yes. to see. Um, I'm interested to see how they incorporate him into the offense because you know we're three we're going on fourth week. And yeah. you start getting the flow with your offense, and sometimes it's not the easiest to insert well additional I, weapons into a mix. So I tell you this much, Ed, with Pearson coming back, whether it be this week or next week, maybe we can get defenses to stop bracketing my boy Butler, who had a huge game anyway. But I mean, he made a catch in triple coverage in that game against San Antonio, where he just went above and beyond everybody else and pulled it down. Now, what are you going to do? You, you can't – I mean, that may open up Sutherland in the middle. I mean, Pearson's a threat. I don't think anybody on the panel here would disagree with that. The sooner – I believe the sooner St. Louis can get Pearson back, I think it's going to open up – oh, I think it's going to open up so much more. If well, I know that – I know that, uh, you know, it was what he says here, A.J. praised his offensive coordinator. He may have praised him this week, but there's a difference. I don't I, – it was pretty quiet after week one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty well, sure that somebody, somebody got the memo with St. Louis. I guess it was back, and uh, and he said, "Look, we, we well, what we're doing to start these games just ain't gonna work moving forward." And and they pretty much started slinging it around to open up the run later in the game, which has worked perfectly. St. Louis is definitely on the rise and is definitely a problem. And I know we're only three weeks in, a lot can change. I don't see anybody in the XFL conference that, that's going to be able to hang with St. Louis moving forward. I really don't. You know, just like this. That's going to be huge. Yeah, but, and just like they understand. say, you need, a, you need a running game to to open up the play action. You know, the trend, same can be said for spreading out the field with your wide receivers to open up the running game, too. And, and like you yep. said, Brett. I think uh, St. Louis has been more effective running the ball in the third and fourth quarter than they have at any other time of the game. Well, yep. we got Sailors back this week. What a huge game he had. And we are, and, and, and Durant had a great game the, the week before. So, I mean, if yeah. you can add a running game in with, with those receivers, I mean, the defense doesn't have to be near as good as, say, Michigan's um, to be able to win games. I mean, I can't wait for Pearson to come back. I think that's going to be a game – changer and so and so the last category we probably only need to spend like 15 seconds on it because i'm sure i'm sure everybody's going to say the same thing right now which team is at the top of the heap i mean it's giddy up stallions still until someone you know rick flair wrestler if you in order to be the man, you got to beat the man until somebody can beat uh, St. Louis or not. Yeah, St. We're in the XFL, but uh, the Birmingham Stallions, you know, it's uh, it's the obvious answer right now. They're they are rolling on all cylinders. Do we need to do you need Brett to say anything or go ahead, Brett? <laughs> he just you know his say, Here we go. You know what they but, say, Brett? You know what they always say when it comes to the playoff time? You always want those teams that are finishing hot and they're playing their best football. Hot nail. What, hap what happens uh, you, if there's something to be said right now for their peaking too soon? Oh, absolutely. They, you know, the two previous seasons we had, uh, we were definitely better at some points in the season than others. Uh, look, so much of it's going to be effort. 
want to and all that. I was so happy. We we were skimming by last year, and I was really happy when uh, uh, New Orleans ran up and down the field on Birmingham and uh, all over our defense. And uh, Houston outwilled us, outwanted it, outphysicaled us. And and I, I remember going back to my friend's house after the game, and I told him, I said, that was the best thing that happened to Birmingham. And he said, well, I said, trust me, the best thing that happened. We didn't lose another game last year. So uh, I, I'm with you about peaking too soon. Birmingham, St. Louis is going to be a problem. But right now, if the playoffs or championship game started right now, Birmingham's the best team. But like you said, a lot can change. So I, I was going. I'm going to tell Bahawk that uh, we're going to get to that discussion before, hopefully, before this hour is up. But when we come back, it is time to get into the picks for Week Four. We will be back after this. This is the Fuel Sports Network. This is the Fuel Sports Network. And that's the bottom line. You want a war? You're gonna get one. give a quick uh, overview of where everybody stands after three weeks. I didn't just, think it was important. I just I <laughs> maybe we should, we should see where we stand record wise just for that. Okay. Time. All right. All right. All right. After <laughs> we can't week count three. my St. Louis pick last week. No, we just got to no, watch out of the way. Moment. Yeah. It's well, we, we're going to disqualify Brett because if we're going to, if he's going to start picking teams by the color of puppies and stuff like that, then we're just going to have <laughs> they're my They're mascots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we got Eric after three weeks leading the pack at nine and three. We got myself at an unfortunate seven and five. Brett bringing up the rear at six and six. Ouch. 500 there, bro. Man. Hey, 
We ain't talking about the other picks earlier to see where I won. Hey, but uh, and I brought that up once. Eric brings this up like eight times a show. We, oh, we, yeah, and, just, and we gotta take the lead from him so we can just I'm just trying to keep the posterity of the show intact. Oh, now, I will. We had two guest pickers last week, Mike. One went two and two, and the other one went one and three. Oh, okay. So, so, so that's what you got to beat this week. So I have all yeah. the confidence in the world in you. All right, yeah, let's do it. Uh, Game number one, which starts at eleven thirty on Saturday, covered by ABC. It's the Memphis Showboats at St. Louis. Mike, go ahead. Yep, I'm leaning uh, Battle Hawks here until I see something uh, with the offensive line. That's a big, big thing that Memphis needs to get addressed. I hope it's a shootout. I hope it's a nice game, nice scoring game, good for television, uh, fans in the dome, get a nice uh, shootout there. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, my pick St. Louis. Brett? Until. You mad, Brett. Well, we'll go, we'll go right up the line because, you know, it does kind of. And with the two on top here for the record yeah, so far. I get a big last because I'm in the That's right. baby. <laughs> uh, until Memphis fixes that offensive line, until we actually see it for our own eyes, I, I can't. Uh, St. Louis, and, and I hope it's close, but after what Birmingham did to Memphis this weekend and don't know the current state of Cookies, uh, and there's going to be probably 30, 35,000, 40,000, whatever in the dome. Uh, it could get kind of ugly, but I'm either way, I'm going with St. Louis. Ballhawk is uh, predicting 37,500 for the game. That's about right on the money. And I, 35 and, I haven't looked, and I haven't looked to see whether there's a St. Louis Cardinal game in town that day or a soccer game in town that day, it would be nice for once to have a game without anything else going on so that we can get a true picture of how many we could actually pack in there. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll go with uh, – if we hit 40 again, I would be pleasantly surprised, but I, I too, probably am leaning towards the 36 to 37,000, which uh, – it's still acceptable, but right. But uh, I am also taking St. Louis in this game. I'm a little bit worried uh, that uh, Coach Flip is going to get their ear this week in practice, and they're going to come in with like a bunch of crazed dogs. And you know, like they say, uh, it's hard to say that it's a true home game. For any team that when they have to jump on an airplane and fly somewhere to play a home game, it's kind of hard to say it's a home game. So if you have 35, 40,000 fans in there and it's loud and it's raucous, that excites the other team's players just like it excites your home team, supposed home team players. So, um, you know, there's something to be said for that as well. But uh, something tells me that we're going to see a little bit different Memphis team this week. And uh, it's not going to be the game that a lot of people are thinking. But uh, Jeez, just take Memphis. Er Come on. So anyway, so Eric, so here we go. Cardinals game at one fifteen, of course. You know what? In my next life, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be a scheduler, and I'm going <laughs> to and, and I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to be a department head for the Cardinals, the BattleHawks. The soccer team, all concerts, and I'm going to schedule it all in one shot and just see the amazing job that I can do because <laughs> having these having these games at the same time just is beyond, beyond. We have the same thing going on here in Michigan. So, But the next two, thankfully the next two home uh, games for the Panthers are staying alone, Michigan Panthers. So looking forward to it. Although the way the Cardinals are playing so far this year, there's no excuse why you'd go to a Cardinals game when there's 80, 81 home games. I'm yeah, sure a thousand you can games miss, to go. Yeah, I can sure you can miss one when they're not even a 500 team at this point in the season. What do you think, Eric? Who are you taking? You didn't say who you were taking. We're not. I said I'm taking St. Louis, didn't I? Oh I, no, I never heard that. Yeah. Did you hear that, Brett? 
No, we kind of lost it after all yeah. the other. I, I heard know. a lot of Memphis this and Memphis that, but I didn't hear a thing. St. Louis, okay? All right. Huh. So Eric is St. Louis, so that that took you too long. So let's move on. <laughs> yeah, I had to save some time. Let's, let's move on. We've got, but I still don't understand this, but we'll talk about it. Why they scheduled when you only got four games going on in the UFL. Why do you have two games scheduled at the same time? It's beyond. Yeah, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have to do some digging and figure out what was behind that for real. So, 6 o'clock, Saturday night on Fox, we've got D.C. at Birmingham. I'm going um, at Birmingham, but I think this is going to be a lot closer than I think what a lot of people may anticipate. I think uh, D.C. gives uh, Birmingham a run for their money, uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to have uh, the elite team in Birmingham, and they'll win close. That's what I've got. I don't even know if the spreads are out yet. Wednesdays. Uh, I, I'm sure DC would give Birmingham a better game than what Memphis did. They don't have the the glaring problem on once you know in one group like a Memphis does with the offensive line. So I think it's going to be a good game, but give me Birmingham. So before we go on, does anybody uh, are you familiar with these running backs, Brett and Mike? Do these names ring a bell with you? They don't with me. Nope, not yet. Uh, the offensive Moses. lineman, which, hey, it looks like, let me see, Simon's, uh, and they have released. Well, they got rid of one of their tackles, the one that kept getting uh, mobbed the other night, which both of them kind of got wrecked, but one of them was a little, a little worse than the other. Uh, Trey that's Williams. not surprising at all. Trey Williams was drafted pretty high in the NFL draft here just a couple of years ago, wasn't he? Isn't he the, the Ohio State running back? Is that the Trey Williams that was with the New Jersey Generals, Mike? What? What? No, new, no, 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 no. That's, no. Are you talking about? You're talking about? Are you talking? I'm thinking of why am I thinking of the quarterback? Where for the backup for Memphis? That's true. Is that which Williams is the quarterback there? No, 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 no. They had a uh, thick thighs guy. Yeah, that is now with Memphis, but they also had his cohort, which was a really good running back with the Generals. Is that him? It's drawing a blank to me. I'll feel, I'll feel, look that yeah. up. Yeah. Well, I that's not a surprise because Memphis has definitely got to got to do some things on that offensive line. I'm I'm surprised they didn't make a couple, you know, uh, another move. But maybe that'll head them in the right direction. So Jay here, before I give my pick, I know you guys are waiting with bated breath. Jay's taking DC to give the first loss of the season to Birmingham. Something tells me he might be a DC fan. <laughs> Just checking. Jay Sanders fact, was Trey Williams from the Generals too. Oh, okay, it was all right. No, hey man, I will pay attention a little bit of spring football. You understand? <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you understand? So anyway, Kapeen. after after Kapeen. having a little bit after having a little bit extra time to to deliberate in my mind, I'm taking Birmingham. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Jay, Jay, tell me you're a DC fan without telling me you're a DC fan. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> the top dog is taking Birmingham as well. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get him a trophy and, and we mail it to each other. Some kind of traveling trophy. Yeah. Something. I mean, okay, the other six o'clock game because evidently we needed to fit two games in the time same time slot. Whatever, uh, yeah. Must, must yeah, be a busy, must be a busy, sport, must be a busy sports weekend out there. Um, we got the Michigan Panthers on their first road game playing it's San Antonio Brahmas. Brahmas just losing their starting quarterback and having to go with the first game for Normandy. What are you thinking? Well, I think now would be Michigan would be the obvious favorites amongst the sports books, and I think it'll continue to be that way throughout the game. And a dome, so you don't have to worry about conditions yet as far as the kicking goes. Uh, defense will be able to pin their ears back, go after this uh, 
this uh, Quentin Normandy. Hey, you know, we'll see how he does. But till then, you know, I'm going to ride with the defense run game. EJ Perry's looking to find his stride with the wide receivers. So um, I'm going Panthers here. If this is the same game I'm thinking of, what in the hell is he doing in Thailand? That just goes to show you how we are international, my friends. International. International. Internationally known. Yes. <laughs> uh, give, me, uh, give me Michigan. Give me Michigan. from Thailand. So, no, one thing too, this is going to be this coaching matchup too is going to be a lot of fun too. You got two experienced NFL head coaches going against each other, so I, this is be one. This will be a fun game to watch. Both defensive minds. Give me, uh, give me Michigan. I'm still. I, I'm more sold on the Panthers than I am the Brahmas. I'm not hating on the Brahmas. They got a lot of fun fans. I enjoy them. The banner and all that. But I still, I still. I mean, you're fourth and 12 away from being one and two. I just show me something. You guys know. I mean, I, Ed, you're in the show me state. Show me something. Really Prove me wrong. wrong. Give me the Paul, Panthers. Paul Hawk is saying San Antonio by two. Jay is saying Michigan by four. And uh, Big Daddy Ed, I'm taking Michigan as well. You know, I think. I think there's an adjustment period, and I hate to say it, with uh, they really were on a roll offense. San Antonio was really on a roll. Garber was doing a good, great job, and so I don't know. Does this throw their timing off a little bit? I don't know, but Michigan's strong point is their defense, and their offense has been done done a little better of late. So I see this as a as a toss up game, but uh, I'm giving the advantage to Michigan. If Garbers was still healthy, I I, I might go I might go a different way. But you know, you talk about the little things like cadence. You know, now you're now you're now you're hearing a different voice. You know, it's the timing with the receivers. Is a week yeah. long enough? Is a week worth of practice long enough to get him on the same page with the receivers and the timing and the routes? And now. You got to go. It'd be different, I guess, if they were going to Houston or whatever. But you're going to play that Michigan defense, man. And this is not a good week to be QB one for the first time uh, for San Antonio. Uh, so I mean, for that reason, I've got to go with Michigan because it just this just smells bad for San Antonio with what's happened to Garbers. I, I yeah. If they pull a win out, kudos. I mean, that's a tough thing to do anyway. Um, but man, this is going to be tough for them. And being uh, at home, I, I just saw the comment here pop up too. Being at home will help, you know. Don't forget, this is Michigan's first road game too. So yeah. this will be the first time maybe EJ Perry is going to have to, you know, cover them ear holes on the helmet to hear the play call. So, you know, to those uh, San Antonio fans out there watching, you know, you pack that dome. You know, you're, you're this is where you are going to have an impact and try to help your Brahmas uh, win a football game here. So I got to ask Ballhawk. Uh, I heard the inside scoop heading into the San Antonio game yesterday that instead of just being loud, they were going to start the chant, Ole, 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 Ole. So, Bohawk, tell me, did they get that going at all? Because I can't say I heard it on the TV. That's better than a cowbell. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I went to St. Louis and worst. I saw. I saw a couple of blue cowbells. I just wanted to take them, throw them on the ground, and stomp them flat. I can don't ever go to Starkville, Mississippi. Then Cowboys. Oh, cowboys. I've never oh. been to a Mississippi State game in Starkville, and it's just a little over an hour away from me. A lot of your Alabama fans go over there, and I told them, I said, I don't have the temperament for those cowbells. I will be oh. in prison. Oh, I'm like, man. oh. God, yeah, and just have 60,000 of them ringing. Oh, yeah, and smash them. <laughs> smash them. So you do know that heading, oh. in, heading into the last game, we have all picked the same teams. Must be easy games. I mean, this, through I all think, three games. I think this is going to be the – I think this one's going to be interesting. So, so this one is going to decide it. I think Eric wants to go last because he just 
you know, he did the same thing last week. He waits till everybody else picks. Oh, and then I he does whatever. He takes whatever angle it takes to stay ahead. I That's would have taken. <laughs> I, if Garbers was still there, I'd probably go with San Antonio at home, but he's not. So, I mean, by proxy, I have to take Michigan. I mean, okay. break down each one. It's just, you know, I got to stay in the lead, too. Sunday, 1 p.m., and I'm kind of disappointed that this game is on FS1. Yeah. I, thought we, I thought we were done with all that crap. I thought we had Fox, ABC, and ESPN. There's this not many FS, of them. This FS1 is it's oh not going to be pretty. God, look at the, oh, okay. Here we go. Here's the here's the here's this combo. I was wondering how long this was gonna take. Yeah. King of Spring football. Yeah. You forgot one thing, Jay. You needed to put the O and three King Perez of Spring. Yeah. In there. Perez. That's what you need to put Perez. in there. Perez. The Perez. King of the O and three. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just I just can't take it anymore. When they're zero and seven, I'm still going to hear the best spring quarterback. In- <laughs> yeah, but go. Okay, so here we go, Mike Arlington at Houston. Well, <clears throat> I'm so I'm actually pretty excited for this game because nothing like having like watching teams with a sense of urgency <clears throat> um, play a football game. So I think this is one of my this might be my favorite game of the week because someone's going to get a win out of this thing. And uh, have yet to see the injury report. I'm curious to see if Mark Thompson will be able to go this week. Um, so, but right now uh, with the home, you know, Houston being at home, Arlington looking for their game. I'm rooting for Houston. And I think I'm going to pick Houston to get their first win, uh, to win this football game. Okay, Brett. Show me something. Houston hadn't showed me shit. I'm taking Arlington. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? You know what? I got to go with the team that that has the best 0-3 spring football quarterback (laughs) in the league. (laughs) I am convinced that the GOAT of spring football – is going to finally get his first win in week four of the 2024 season. Give me Arlington. And, and you know, you'll never change Dirty's mind about that. Remember I told you, you called me yesterday and told me uh, uh, inflation was created, that it wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some people's heads – Thicker than the pavement, but that's none of my business. <laughs> Great. Now he's going to be popping on here any minute. Why would you even bring No, he's up? not. No, no he's, he's not. not. We're about done either anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, smart pick, obviously, is Arlington. I think they are the better 0-3 team. Houston just not has not shown me enough offensively. I thought maybe with that first drive, Mike, last last week or Sunday, I, th- I thought, man, maybe they got to figure it out. Maybe maybe yeah. Reed was the maybe Reed was the guy, and then it just all unraveled. Yeah. Um, so until Houston can show me anything on the defensive side where they were supposed to be strong, or the offensive side where they've been pretty much anemic all year, I mean Arlington, I got to go with Arlington. I got to go with Arlington. Reasons, you know, with the Houston pick too, you know, they now this is you know, this is going against Michigan, you're, not going against you're picking Arlington. with your heart, Mike. Just say it. I'm picking with my heart. With his now, USFL heart. Leo Leo would say Dude, I'm gonna tell you what, he he uh some of these guys are so biased on this USFL XFL thing. <laughs> what has Houston done this year Nothing. to make you think they could beat anybody? <laughs> Hey, no, I, hey, I'm, I said, hey, they're at home. I'm taking, I'm going with the home crowd. I think I'm rooting for them so they can have all five thousand of them. Yeah, all five thousand of them. Yep, they're gonna, they're gonna. Oh, Brett. Hopefully, Mark Thompson's back. Um, he's, he's a good running back to follow and cheer for. Uh, puts on a show when he's on the football field. So I hope the Houston get a win for that fan base. There, he better have two hundred and fifty yards. If he's back, Ooh. he better rush for two fifty. 
Man, he's a horse. He's a horse. He he's he's a he's a he's a tough guy, man, and he's he's tough to deal with. But I mean, I just I I think a lot of Houston problems is just who's the head coach. I mean, yeah, it, you got you got guys rolling their eyes and shaking their head at him at halftime of the first game of the year. I mean, that's when, that kind of tells you all you need to know. When they've got D. Filippo mic'd up. When they got Anthony Beck mic'd up, Skip Holtz, whoever it is, I love it. Now hold on now. CJ no, no, doesn't that. he doesn't say anything. Now I don't know if we there's another transaction we didn't talk about. Was that the acquisition of Kenji Bahar at quarterback? So for those familiar watch the gamblers last week. You know, Kenji Bahar gave he can run, he can move, he can cause some problems. So I think Yeah, you know, he's he's quickly, mobile. How quickly can he, you know, pick up back on the offense? Is there enough is there a lot of change on the offense? So is this, you know, if the Coordinated offenses stays the same, you know, just getting back conditioned uh, for the game. So could we see him at the hell? We don't know. But um, if he is, though, look out. I think uh, it's a completely different game. You could say the same thing about him that you could with Dormady from San Antonio. You could, yeah. You know, where the timing is at, just the, the cadence itself, just a lot of things. I mean, you're not going to jump right in week one. I mean, I guess it has happened. I'm not saying it can't mm-hmm. happen, but it's very difficult to jump in week one. I mean, the, the Renegades defense is not bad. So, I mean, to just jump in there and, and and take the offense to this level from here is, I mean, it can happen. I shouldn't say it, it can't, but um, you're. I think they're in the same boat if they go that direction that uh, San Antonio, unfortunately, is in. So, I mean – We'll see at kickoff, right? <laughs> yeah, now, that's right. Brett, now, Brett, I'm I'm got to say I'm really disappointed in you because before the game started on Saturday, I believe I was listening to a feed on Facebook, basically mm-hmm. basically telling everybody that you'd heard enough about attendance and you didn't want to hear any more <laughs> about it. Here we go. Who, Where's my popcorn? Good? Who, who was the guy that just shot out 5,000 5, fans in the Houston game? You just uh, had to do it, didn't you? I couldn't. I, I mean, it, I've been holding it in. I mean, I mean <laughs> I, I, I'm probably going to lose every one of our sponsors if I talk about attendance, so I'm just going to leave it be. That was, yeah. that was my shot for the week. So, uh, oh, man, I was ready to do a, a – uh, Brett's rant. I mean, go uh, out and support your damn teams for uh, for you know what sakes. I mean, shit. Five, six, <laughs> seven, eight thousand people. Give me a fucking break. I mean, come <laughs> on, guys. I mean, that. Come on now. That. It, you have a bleep? Right now, have a bleep? Had, right, I'm done. Had, I'm done. We've had we've had a great show now. I don't want to <laughs> have to take it down just because of <laughs> Brett's blow up. <laughs> We got a graphic. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's a graphic. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you guys have seen me battling with the Birmingham fans today. I done suspended one woman. I didn't know why you're being so rude. I will say, lady, I'm not being rude. I'm I'm being truthful. You can't handle the truth. You don't know what you're talking about. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You the truth. You know, I thought about that movie today, too. You know, did you order the Code Red? Just randomly think yeah. about a few good men. You know? You're damn right I did. Did you order 5,000 fans? You're damn right I did. Let me give you 5,000 fans and think it was okay. This this is this, this is Brett right here. Yeah. This, this sums up the show for today. He's gonna make the league some money. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's excuse after excuse. You know we got uh, you know girls softball going on. We got travel baseball going on. We got this going on. Oh, it might rain Saturday night. I said there was seventy two thousand fucking people at Bryant Denny Stadium for inter squad scrimmage Saturday. Don't I'm saying? And I told him I said I know none of y'all like me, and I know I don't care. Y'all come up, y'all come up with every damn excuse under the sun to not go and support the team. 
Fan so, is short for fanatic. So get your asses to the stadium and support your damn teams. So 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 how many fans does the lower bowl hold in Alabama? At Protector Stadium? Yeah. Now I know you only do half, but if it was No, full, we don't only do half. They start with half. And it now, like we, I've had a couple of fans say, "Oh no, they only sell half." I said, "You're not going to make an excuse for our fan base. They will not turn a fan away at Protective Stadium until we hit forty-five thousand. They will not. You know, it's forty-five, forty-seven thousand capacity. So don't sit there and say, "Oh, it's because they didn't have enough tickets to sell." That's why I got so pissed at that woman yeah, and said, "Whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa! No, we're not fitting to make that excuse." Okay. No, no, no. Rub your, rub your ears, because I'm trying to Woo ask you a question, and you won't Woo let me. Woo I want to know, how many does the lower bowl hold? At Protective Stadium. Stadium? Yes. 38,000. So half of 38 would be 19,000, correct? Yes, sir. So here I am. I'm watching the game. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, wow, they got a pretty good, I mean, both had, I mean, what they showed, a the little shade. bit light, a little In bit, little bit light on the, the end zones a little bit on both sides, but clearly between the goal line, goal, goal line zone, it was pretty much filled. And they come out with your number as being 12,265. So if you're saying half of the lower bowl is 19, and yes, I sir. didn't see I didn't see a whole lot of gaps in there for half of the lower bowl. The number I'm, didn't make sense to any of us that was at the game, but uh, you know, I was instructed by Dirty when he called yesterday that that was the correct number. Inflation wasn't real, and what else did he say? <laughs> So I'm just laughing. I'm like, man, I got to go. I just want, I hung up the phone and I swear all I said was, so and my that, question, that was all I said. So my question is when they count tickets, they're basically, when you go through the turnstile, I don't know. You're counting, you're counting as one, right? I mean, you can, I mean, you can. Give tickets away. I mean, you can do the buy right. one get four. You can do the right. buy one get two. All that. But if their attendance is their attendance paid tickets, or is their attendance paid tickets plus the freebies that they gave out? Is well, their attendance I, is their attendance the count of the people who go through the turnstiles? Well, what is the you guys counting? are in the same chat I'm in, and I know we can't talk about it publicly, and I would never do that, of course. But you saw the text I saw in the chat yesterday, so you you tell me what's going on at these games because you could have held a gun to my head Saturday, and I said there ain't one person under fifteen thousand in the stadium, not one. And when a number come out, I was like, you know, I, I, I'm still, you know, we talked about it Saturday night, uh, me and some guys, and I even messaged y'all and said, there's just, there's no way that's, but whatever. I mean, it is what it is, but you guys saw the text I saw and, you know, we understand that there was a lot more people they thought in San Antonio Sunday than what there was at Easter, but yet then the Easter number comes out and it's 2000 more than the attendance was reported yesterday. So you, you guys make sense of it to me is attendance at a lot of these venues where they need to be not even close, but I don't know if the numbers we're getting is accurate either. It looked good on TV to me watching the Birmingham game. Yeah. I, I, so having said that, we're going to we're going to call this week a wrap. Uh, I wanted to get into a little bit of NFL, uh, but we didn't get. Sorry, to sponsors. It. I'll behave next week. Just yeah. give me one so, preview. So next week, yeah. next Sorry. week we're looking at doing a few different things. It's draft week, and so we've got some irons in the fire trying to 
think what we want to do there. So we'll we'll give you more information on. I'll be working the draft. I'll be wet the draft with the Detroit Sports Commission. So that'll be. Oh wow! So they're even being on the spot reporter, huh? That yeah, Yeah. you're you're a guy, Mike. You might be on the spot guy. When the New York Jets pick, all I want to see is their reaction. Now I don't know how close I'll be at the stage though, and they have me, you know, they have me some. I don't know what my position there is, but yeah, I mean, if you need somebody on the scene, I'd be more than happy to. So uh, we're gonna hire you to find <laughs> out whether the Vikings are gonna try and trade up in the first round, or whether they're gonna do their normal and trade <laughs> down three, three or four times until they got thirty-five picks in the seventh round. So God, that sounds like the Chicago Bears there. Yeah, oh, right? God. So anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. See you again. Thanks, Mike, for uh, joining us again. Mike's uh, our new uh, president uh, from our chapter in Michigan for the Fuel Sports Network. So we're looking to do some great things through him. And we are but, we are taking donations to get Mike a watch. So that's, right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, now that he knows to look for the the, we'll be all right. Anyway, thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Where did it go? There it is. God, I... We're still live. No, we won't be in for a minute here. We're still live.